The search for the right answers in an answer-filled world can be both difficult and destructive if you come up with the wrong answers. Just how does one know if what they believe is correct? It is deeper than just what is correct for you. Who has the final say? Who is correct? Join us at Jackson First Baptist Church as we find God's answers for the mess in the world. Romans chapter 15 and verse 20. Romans chapter 15 and verse 20. As today we're going to talk together about ambition. We're going to talk together about ambition. Uh, when it comes to the subject of ambition, there's, there's just a lot we're going to be able to say together today. But, but I want you to hear this. I think this message is extremely timely for where we are in society, particularly in America. Driving one early morning here, I was listening to the economic forecast for our country. It was not a Republican or a Democratic forecaster. It was just somebody who does it. And they said this, the latest statistics say this, that in America, there are now, right now, 10 million jobs that are vacant. 10 million jobs are vacant in America right now. And this trusted economist that they were, uh, they were interviewing said this, and I want you to hear this. He said this, and it, it, it startled me. He said this, America does not have a work problem. America has a willpower problem. A willpower problem. Problem as I as I let that that process, I I, I I thought of what I was preaching this weekend, and I, I want you to hear the word of the Lord, Romans fifteen and twenty. Paul said this, and thus I make it my ambition. The King James version of the Bible uses the word strive. You actually could translate it like this: is doing everything you can. Paul actually was saying, he said, I'm doing everything I can. To preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named. Now listen to this. Look what he says here. Lest I build on someone else's foundation. I have discovered this in my life, that when you see someone's ambition, it's a revelation of who they are. It's not only a revelation of who they are, it is also a, a picture of what they are about. Now, think with me about this for just a moment. The Apostle Paul has revealed to us for all these many weeks together his ambition. His ambition, Romans 1 and 16 and 17, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So Paul has been sharing with us the, that Christ is the answer for the mess that's in the world. Amen? And so think about this, Romans 1 through 11, well, he gave us the implications of all that that meant. And we went to the depths of theology as you and I talked together about, about sanctification, about glorification, about justification, redemption. We talked about election versus free will. We talked about all of these things, and we just waited all the way through it. And then we came to chapter 12, and Paul began to give us the application. The application of, of the implication of if you make Christ the Lord of your life. And so, so now Paul is finished with all this teaching. He's under the anointing of God. It's not his word. It is God's word. And so now as he, as he summarizes, as he's landing the plane, and just like most preachers, it takes him two chapters to land the plane. And so as he's landing the plane, he begins now to personally get involved and said, I want you to know what my ambition is. So here's, the, here's a question for you. Define ambition. I want to take for a moment for you to define for yourself. And maybe throughout the sermon, you'll take a moment if you, you get with me at some point, if you get the willpower. So let me ask you again, what are your ambitions in life? Paul's ambition was clear that he wanted to reach a lost and dying world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now on this day, this is really nothing more than a pep rally for me with you to say to you that God wants you to have some ambition. Now we know, here's four biblical facts about ambition. Number one is this, ambitions change throughout your life. Is that true? What you were for at one point, you changed. Paul said, he said, that, I want you to know in verse 20 that I make it my ambition. The truth is that it had not always been his ambition. Before coming to Christ, his ambition was to destroy the church. But then he came to know Christ, his ambition changed. Secondly, ambitions can be counterproductive. You remember how the, that Peter took Jesus aside in Mark 8. And he said, Lord, may you never go to the cross. 
You see, sometimes you can have an ambition, and that ambition can get you into trouble. And so uh, ambitions can be counterproductive. Thirdly, ambitions, can listen to this, can chain you to a dead-end life. There are people watching online. I, I met a person this week who, who just trying to get out of what they got into years ago. What I'm saying is this, that you can get locked into something. The devil can put something in your mind and in your heart, and you could go down a path and chain yourself to it. For example, a man had an ambition to own a new car, and he bought the new car, and they said to me, no money down, and you only have to pay for it for 20 years. Can they get an amen? Five years in, the engine blew up, and, and he went back to try to get another car. His ambition for that vehicle just to have one put him in a place that he was chained to it, and he's still chained to it. He's now thumbing along the way, paying a payment. Now, lastly and finally, write this down. Ambition can be a catalyst for great things. If you have the right ambition, and if you're doing the right thing, you as an individual can live a life of effectiveness. Now, uh, you, I want you to see this in your notes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul shares this. Whether we are home or away, it is our aim to please the Lord. Now, I've been going fast, and you've been going through notes, and you've been writing down. So let me ask you, what have you grasped, if anything? So what have you grasped, if anything? When it, for me, when I, when I define the word ambition, for me, it is, listen, it's what reveals and also fuels the passion of my life. It reveals and fuels the passion of my life. Well, I believe that economist was correctly and says that America has a willpower problem. And I believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has a willpower problem. And so you say, Pastor, what do you mean? Paul had given us his ambition, Romans 1.16. We, we, I quoted it. And then we read chapter 15 and verse 20. So, so here is Paul's, not, not my, not my made-up one or what I think he said. Look at the screen. Here was his ambition. Whether we are home or away, it is our aim to please the Lord. That's important. Paul says, I want you to know that. And so out of that, Paul's ambition was this. Here's his ambition. To glorify God with his life resulting in people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Would you say that with me? Paul's ambition was to glorify God with this life resulting in people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I sat yesterday morning reviewing this, and here's what it hit me. Brother Sam, here's what it hit me. Many of you are going to hear this. Preachers saying by this that you ought to sell your house, become a missionary, and go overseas. That's all most of us ever hear. Or you ought to be a preacher and become a preacher and suffer all your life. That's not what Paul was doing. The call upon your life is this, is to leverage where you are and say, God, here is my life. I'm going to give it to you right now. I, I, I wrote this down yesterday. God, I'm going to leverage my career for you. I'm going to leverage my relationship. I'm going to leverage my circle of influence. I'm going to leverage my gifts and my talents. God, I'm going to take my place of residence and make it not only in my house, but around my house, my, my mission field. In other words, God is wanting to retool you to be able to go right back to where you are, but to be different with ambition. No amens yet. Now, I know it's not my fault if you're not amen. It may be that I'm getting close into where you live. But listen to me, some of you are living your life without godly ambition. You're busy, I know you are. You're working, you're tired, you're testy because of that. you're right now. Some of you say, but I didn't get two hours of sleep maybe last night. I don't know that. But you don't have an ambition. Or if you have an ambition, that ambition is God. You're so mad. You're so, I see it all the time. People just want to be mean to each other and hateful to each other. They're so tired. They're so worn out. And they just don't understand why. And they're blaming it on COVID. They're blaming it on the president. They're blaming it on the church. They're blaming it on their spouse. Blaming it on their parents. And the truth is, when you get this in line, you can't be stopped. You'll get tired, but it'll be a good tire. You, you, you will have hard days, but it'll be a good hard day. You'll find yourself exhausting yourself for the right thing. And all I'm going to do today is tell you this, that Paul gave encouragement to the church that if this was their ambition, that they would be so encouraged that they would touch the world. So here's all this, just a pep rally today. There's just a pep rally. Two things I want to get laid before you. Number one is this, I know you can do this. 
There's some things you can't do. Guys, you can't have a baby. Can I get an amen, men? I don't, not can't do, I want to. I don't want to. There's things you can't do. I never would want to. There's things that ladies cannot do, and that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to get into that. There's things that you can't do. But here is something that you can do. You can leverage your life for the glory of God that leads to others coming to know Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Look with me in the text. Chapter 15 and verse number 14. Here's what Paul says. It's amazing what he says. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Now watch this. Feel with not all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Man, Paul really believed in them, didn't he? Look in verse 15. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by the way of reminder. Yes, Paul, for 14 chapters you have worn us out. Can I get an amen? Finally, some amens in the house of God. All right. I'm getting like beaver losing my hearing. Listen to what he says. Because of the grace given to me by God. Verse 16, I'm a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, I know you can do this. When he says, I'm satisfied, he's not saying I've sat back and I've ate all this thing and and I'm just watching you. He's with them. King James Version says, I'm persuaded. He said, I'm persuaded here that you have been given by God these things so that you could leverage your life, no matter what circumstance that you're in, that you would live it for God so that other people would be saved. Now think about this. Say, how did Paul know that? Well, think about this. What did Paul know? Five things he knew. One, the Spirit of God resided inside of them. The Spirit of God resided. He said, I'm satisfied you're full of goodness. That, those, that phrase, full of goodness, if you look the word goodness up, it's in Galatians 5, 23 and 24. It is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Can I tell you today that I am satisfied that you as a church member, if you are in Christ, you can be good. You can go to the store, be different than the world. You can go to your job when they're increasing the pressure, and you can be good. You say, Preacher, I don't want to be good. Let's just be honest. But you get full of Jesus, you can't help but be good. What is it right now that you don't want to do? You're fighting doing it, but you know it's the good thing. You know it's the thing that could change someone's life. If you would just be good and live the right way and take the high road. Now Paul says to that church, he says, I want you to know the Spirit of God resides in you. Secondly, the Word of God was changing them. He says, you're filled with all knowledge. Listen to me. They could live differently because they have the Word of God. Friend, let me tell you something today. You can do it. If you just get in this book, you may not have been to seminary. You don't have to be. You may have a third grade education. You don't have to have. If you got the living Word of God, the more of it is in you, the more that you can live your life. Some say, I can't do it. The reason you can't do it is because Hallmark can't do it. I'm going to tell you, the news cannot do it. The books that you read, the, the magazines that you read, the, the, the blog sites that you're on, they can't do it, but this book is living and active, and this book can do it. I'm telling you, in every counseling session that I'm in, this is the guide. I want to tell you, you can do it. But the Word of God has to be the thing that's changing your life. Do you know Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 5, that we are enriched in the Word of God? You as a church are blessed to be equipped at a higher level than any church in our city. That's not knocking any of the church in this city. But listen to me, if you don't come to church, if you just ever watch online, if you don't get in a Sunday school class, if you're not in a community group, if you're not a part of what we do around here in the Southwest University, you're not getting fed the Word of God. Because I know this, that, that we need to be fed the Word of God. That's why our children are being fed in after-school care. They're being fed the Word of God. They'll be fed the Word of God in the 11 o'clock hour. We, they're, so we're pouring into them. And I want to tell you this day, you can't be stopped when the Word of God is changing you. But also this, you can do it because the ways of God are before you. The ways of God are before you. He says you're able to instruct one another. I want to tell you, you can't help your neighbor. You can't help your friend. You can't help that one that you might sit beside of on an airplane or that you might be at the doctor's office with, the one that you may run into at McDonald's or wherever. You can help them. You can do it today. But if your ambition is to get in and get out and get away, you'll never do it. COVID has robbed us. I'm going to tell you this today. Uh, Listen to me. I know there are issues in life, but don't let the issues rob you of what you can do. You have the way. Mom, you can instruct other mothers. Dad, you can instruct single person. No one's been through what you've been through. You are fully qualified. 
with the Word of God and the Spirit of God that you know the right ways to live. Some of you say, Preacher, I don't want to hear anymore. Well, Paul for 14 chapters was bold in writing to us. Why won't you be bold? You don't need me at your Thanksgiving table. You need Jesus. You can do it. You don't, you, you don't need a deacon. You can do it. There's nothing wrong with having them. You don't need a Sunday school teacher. You can do it because the ways of God are before you. And then not only that, Paul says, listen to this, the, the grace of God was flowing through them. Paul said there in verse 16 that, that grace was given to me by God. Now, Paul understood something. Without God, he was nothing. Paul said the grace of God's flowing. The truth is the devil will whisper to you and say you can't do it because of who you used to be. Am I right? The devil will say to you, not only can you not do it because of who you used to be, you can't do it because of what you're going through right now. You can't do it because of what's in your circumstance in your life. But I want to tell you that Paul was the chief of sinners, and he understood this, that in Christ it all changes. So I'm here today to tell you that you can do it. Here's our pep rally. Think about Paul. He was a murderer and became a minister. I want you to think about Peter. Peter was ignorant, but God made him a theologian. I want you to know that, that John was a man who was uneducated, but he became a defender of his faith. Mark was a guy who could not in his life do anything but run away, but God transformed him and he worked. I'm going to tell you, you can do it, but you've got to be willing. There's one other part. The love of God compelled them. The love of God compelled them. In verse 16, he said, I'm a minister of Christ Jesus. To be a minister means that you are a person, you are a servant. In the Old Testament, the minister served in the temple, the people that came. In the New Testament, we get this great word, deaconos, deacon, that we become deacons, servants of God. Do you know we're getting ready today to, to, to uh, elect uh, another term of these deacons? We, we, we get, we're going to ordain three of them, new guys, in January. Two more in January. Come on as yoke fellows. We are servants. You are servants. I'm going to tell you, if you have the love of God in your your heart. You know what Paul discovered was this, brothers and sisters. This, I discovered this with all my heart. You read it if you read the book with me. Paul realized this, that people were his gift back to God. Did you hear that? People were his gift back to God. If you love somebody so much, you want them to meet them. Paul understood this, that someday Jesus was coming back. And he wanted them to be able to see that. I want to tell you, if you're in love with Jesus, you'll be in love with people because you want them to come to Jesus. Say, preacher, I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. You, as a church, can do it. But you've got to be willing to say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Paul says, I just want you to know that I'm doing it. But not only does he say you can do it, Paul also says this number two, I know you'll be successful while you are doing it. You know, I can tell you that you can do things all the time, and you can just mess it up. Tony, I still may have to come help you get me to finish that last little project for sure. But see, I know who to get in contact with. Can I get an amen? Paul here in this text, it's amazing, he knows who we can get in contact with. Look what he says here in the text, verse 17. In Christ Jesus, then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by the word and deed. You notice what he said, in Christ Jesus, I have reason to be proud. But he said that, verse 18 again, but I will not venture. One translation says, I will not dare speak of myself. Paul's ambition was not to glorify himself. Some of us, if we're not careful, pride will rise up. Am I telling the truth? Sometimes self-promotion. Sometimes jealousy. Sometimes a, a, compass, a, a compulsive person who is really uh, kind of quiet can, can do it as well. Listen, Paul says, I want to tell you, all that I am is because of Christ. Everything inside of me. So I want to tell you this today. You can do it, and y'all know this, you'll be successful if you're not doing it for you. You know why marriages break up? People get tired of having ambition for the other. You want to know why people quit going to church? Is they lose the right ambition. You know why students drop out of school? They lose their ambition. Why, why there are 10 million jobs in America that are open today? It's because no one has the willpower to serve others. I'm thankful for those who have the willpower, who say, God, I, this is my calling. All of us are not, are not called to go to college and waste all of our money. Can I get an amen? Many of us are called. That we could, the talents and the giftings that we have, let me tell you, we, we are in here today because Georgia Power has a bunch of people that work hard. 
We're in here today because, I'm going to tell you this, that, that the gas company turned on the gas. We're here today because the city picked up the garbage. We're here today because policemen and police women care for us. It's so the people that said, I care about somebody else. And so today, I hear you, well, you hear me, I'm not saying that you're to sell everything and go overseas. That may be God's call upon your life. But what I'm saying is this, that you can leverage your life for the glory of God. And Paul says, I'm going to tell you this. How, how could Paul say he knew they'd be successful? Three reasons. Number one, because people were coming to genuine faith. Are, are you hearing about church of people coming to faith? The six people that came to know the, the Lord on Friday night, the, the folks that came to know the Lord on Wednesday night together. Think about the thousands of boxes that are going to go out from Operation Christmas Child, laying our hands upon every one of them and saying, God, you can use the gospel that's put in this box so that lives would be changed. In a couple of weeks, as I get to stand out in line with all those people, as they come through the food pantry line, they have to hear the gospel first before they, hear, they get the food. Listen to me. I know this. People are coming to the Lord. People are coming to the Lord all over this nation and, and all over this world. You say, but preacher, I'm not seeing it. I don't know about where you are, but I'm telling you, you can be successful. But I also know this. Romans 10, 17 tells us if we keep our mouths closed, People are not going to be saved. Paul was saying, I'm, I'm doing this. I, I'm sharing this. But not only were they coming to faith, they were growing in genuine faith. When he said there in the text in verse 18, they're obedience by the word and deed. The word, I think about this, that, that is the spoken word, the audible word. You may be surprised because we've read so much about Paul. You probably think that he was an elegant speaker. You probably think that he was highly motivated. Can I tell you this? He was motivated. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said this, When I came to you, my words were not very, very strong. When I came to you, he actually says, actually chapter 3, my words did not have, were not the wisdom of men, but God was speaking through me. See, you would have seen Paul beforehand. He had an eye problem. He was not something to look at. He would not have been the skinny jeans preacher of the day. Paul probably, you'd seen him with scars on his face. You would, might have met him and you would not have had anything to want to do with him. But when the Spirit of God touched his life and began to move upon his life, Paul would come and there he was trembling, but God would use him. I, just, I want to tell you today that God wants to use you. People are coming to genuine faith and they're growing in that faith. That's the key. If you, you say, I really, want to, I really want to live my life and leverage my life for God, well, you, you just start growing. I mean this with all my heart. You, you've got to make some decisions in your life. I want to grow. Listen to what our Egyptian partner said in the Middle East. I'm supposed to go to, to, go to uh, Egypt for a conference in February to teach. And, and, and he said, Pastor, and he was just sharing his heart. He said, Pastor, he said, I said, well, why do you want me to go? Sure, and I talked about this. Now, if somebody who's suffering asks you who does not suffer to come teach on the suffering, what do you have to say? What do you have to say? I mean, Tony, what would we have to say to somebody who's lived their life having to whisper when they sing, having to be, barely speak when they teach because if they get caught, they go straight to prison? What do I have to say? Listen to what the man said to me. He said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. When you're full of Jesus and when you are, and others are full of Jesus, you bring something to the table that they can't get online. I said, what do you mean? So this, you can find anything that you want to about anything online. You can YouTube it. You can blog it. You, you can find anything you want anywhere. He said, but there's something that they can't get, and that is the growth in Christ that comes on your knees and in the Spirit of God and in the Word of God apart from an authentic relationship. And friend, today I think what's happening to us in this church is this. We are inundated with information, and we're bankrupt of anointing. We are inundated with information. But we're banked up with anointing. I come in here and scream for these moments, and y'all sit here like this. The other place I go and preach, because they're so hungry for it, you know what? They're amening, they're leaning up, they're getting in close, they're hungering and thirsting. Friend, let me ask you this what is your ambition? I'm not on, I love you. This is a pep rally today. But listen to me, I've been in pep rallies too when we went out and got beat to death because we didn't have an anointing. You've got to come to the place now that you make that decision in your own life. Listen to me. These people were not only coming and growing, they were completed in their faith. God was completing them in their faith. Look in verse 19. He says, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, 
that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Akurim, I have fully fulfilled my ministry of the gospel. The word for, there for fulfilled means completed. It means I'm content, I'm rewarded, I'm accomplished. Are you at the place in your life that you feel genuine accomplishment? Are you at the place with your life that you know that your life is being leveraged for the glory of God? That people are coming to know the Lord. You may not be the one, like Brother Ernie, who takes care of me this morning. He leads our security ministry with others in our church. In our church, He's not the one preaching, but he's the one making sure that I get to. See, we all have a part in that. Brother Danny and the deacon body of this church, I, I don't take it for granted that, that I get all the hours that I get to study and pray and minister in house and out of house to people because they take care. If someone's sick at the hospital, they're the first one to call. I don't take that for granted. Miss Heather keeps this place and her team immaculate, so when I come in, I'm not having to pick up dirt all the way down the hall. See, we all have a part in that, but if we are a part of that, but as you're picking up the dirt, friend, listen, somebody comes by, why are you picking up dirt? It's funny that you asked me that. Because as I do this, I am fulfilling my part so that the gospel is proclaimed around the world. Now watch this, and usually what ends up happening is as you're doing that, God will bring somebody to you who understands something like that, and you share the gospel with them, and they get saved. Now let me ask you this. Here's the question that comes on the screen. What are your personal ambitions? What are your personal ambitions? It's not my job to tell you what yours is, but I do know this, that we are to glorify God with our life, resulting in people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. You see, only when you have ambition will you fight through. Can I tell you this day? You can do it. And you can be successful if you'll have the right ambition. So here's how we close. Number one is this. You need to take, take inventory of your ambition. just want to tell you this as you leave here today. Are you living a life that just kind of happens without ambition? If you've kind of, kind of morphed into a life that just happens without ambition, here's the second thing. Make changes in your ambition. Are you a person today that maybe you're locked into something that's a dead end that's never going to be any different? Let me tell you, God can take it and change it. Are you just being lazy and living for the moment? I meet people all the time that, that they just live for the moment. I want to tell you that our moments will end, James says. It'll be like a vapor. It'll be gone one of these days. Live, you can make a difference. If you want to be different, you can. Listen, make changes. For some of us today, it's only simple this, reaffirm. You need, to, you need to reaffirm that what, how you started this thing in the first place. You need to get cranked back up for the kingdom of God. You need to get cranked back up, get excited, get over whatever it is, surrender to God, and get back into your ambition of who you are. We've all been wounded. We've all been hurt. We've all had things come. This has been the hardest 18 to 20 months of my life in ministry, but it's been the best. Because we said, this is who we are, and this is what we'll be about. If I lose my hair, if I lose my teeth, if I lose my health, I'm going to finish strong. And so I want to encourage you today, reaffirm. Just say at the end of the service when we pray, God, 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 you know what I'm to be about. And lastly and finally, maybe you need to set your ambition on Christ. For some in this room, you've never done that. You, you joined a church, but you never, ever surrendered your life, Jesus. Now, I know most in this room personally, and you've given your life to Christ, I believe. But what if you hadn't? What if you lived your life, and you came to the end and died, and stood before God, and, and He said, why should I let you into heaven? And you said, I'm a Christian. And God said, but you never knew me. See, I'm not a Christian because I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor because I got, God saved me. That, that's the only thing. And what does it mean to be saved? It, mean, it means this, that your sins have been forgiven, that you've transformed, listen, that you, you have transferred all leadership over to Him. You trust Him for this life and the life to come. So, so have you repented of your sin and said, God, I transfer my leadership over to you. How do you do that? By faith. You surrender your life to him by faith. And watching online, there are people who are learning to do that. And so today, I just want to ask you this. Have you done that? Have you truly, genuinely, by faith, said, God, I, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, you're the Son of God. You came to be the Savior. I repent. I need your forgiveness. 
I receive it, be the Lord of my life. The preacher, I've prayed that prayer, but how do I know? Here's how you know. What we've talked about today is what you're doing. If you've never done that, that's why your life is never, ever satisfied. Thank you for taking the time to find God's answers to life's greatest issues. We hope that you would reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions and check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.